Now, to call you back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the show, misogyny and sexism is clearly alive and well. You don't need me to tell that to you. And if you do, seriously, then you really need to watch this segment. In a recent article, Dr. Dabney Evans outlines what she calls the hate crime that you never hear about, namely femicide, the killing of women because of their gender. According to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, 35.6% of American women have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. The impact of that violence can include physical injury, psychological distress, loss of work, and the need for legal services. Nearly 3,000 women are murdered in the U.S. each year, and just over half are committed by women's partners. Numbers, numbers, numbers. What's the point? Well, Evans's point is to not only lift up the veil on violence against women, but to push for the understanding of a hate crime to include femicide, and to push for federal legislation specifically naming femicide. Now, if, you, if part of you shrugs or feels slightly uncomfortable at the thought of calling femicide a hate crime, or calling yourself a feminist, or even giving sway to feminism in general, you should watch this video, but also, Dr. Heidi Lewis will ask you to ask yourself why. Why does that bother you? Dr. Heidi Lewis is a professor at Colorado College in the Feminist and Gender, Gender Studies program. She hosts a blog called Fem Geniuses and writes for the Feminist Wire. We caught up with her when she was in Berlin teaching a course entitled Hidden Spaces, Hidden Narratives. Here's what she has to say about feminism today. There are still um, strong, long-lasting misconceptions about what feminism even is. Most of the things that people want to talk to me about that have a, um, a very limited knowledge of feminism is what it is. What is it? You know, what does it do? What is it for? Who is it for? Who is it? Who created it? And things like that. But the problem I think that we still have, and this is why theory is so important to me, the ways that people think are really important to me because people still think incorrect or problematic things about what feminism is. So that if, if, if we say, you know, X, is a feminist way of thinking. If, for instance, if I'm talking, if, like people are unaware to this day that feminism is concerned with things other than women or gender. So that the Feminist Wire was um, an important space for me before I became a member of the team because it was doing the work of reminding people that feminism has always been about more than just gender, more than just women. Feminism for me um, is about justice, injustice, oppression, centers, margins. So my feminism, even though it's focused specifically on black communities, typically, and media and popular culture, my feminism is one that is always concerned with the um, impetuses for and implications of oppression, whether we're talking individual level, local level, national level, global level, systemic level. You say your feminism is not just about, you know, women. And I think that's a very important point yeah. because feminism really does tie to all of these issues because it is about equality through the, the sexes, through the races, through classes. Um, so I'm curious it's specifically about the, the role of women, not just in, in promoting this concept of feminism that is not just, you know, feminazi or, you know, those hashtags, feminism is awful, feminism is cruelty, how to spot a feminist. Mm -hmm. How do you see women in particularly stepping away from this and even, even allies, you know, men or uh, the LGBT community, how do you see people... Uh, stepping away from this um, this sort of corporatized mentality about feminism? A lot of anti-feminism is sexist. So that, um, just for instance, today, um, my students and I were in Germany, we're in Berlin, um, doing some studying about um, injustice, oppression, marginalization, resistance in Berlin, marginalized people and communities. And um, one of my students asked a question that I get often, and it was, she asked, there was some depiction of a feminist and there was some angry looking stuff around the depiction. And the student asked, and this isn't unique to her, you know, why do feminists continue to allow themselves to be portrayed this way when there's such a stigma around the angry? And that's sexist. Mm -hmm. um, Gordon Ramsay has made millions of dollars uh, profiting from rage. This man screams and yells and throws things and is very verbally violent and he has a tv show 
Um, Bill O'Reilly is one of the angriest people on television today. There are many cases that we can point. Eminem has made a billion dollar corrupt career being pretty much angry at everyone from his mother to the mother of his children, his ex-wife. So it's so there. So but the only time anger becomes problematic is when women are angry because women are not supposed to be angry. And especially if you're a woman of color and a black woman, as I am, you really aren't supposed to be angry. You're supposed to just, you know, yeah. be, you know, or there's going to be a stereotype about you. You're going to feel like, you know, people are going to be uncomfortable because anger is power. You know, Audre Lorde writes about the uses of anger and anger as a source of power, a source of strength, a source of resistance. Right. Rebellion. And so the people who um, sort of are interested in, in, in figuring out how to resist those kinds of feminist feminazi, which I hate to even say out of my mouth, but, um, you know, feminism is awful. I think one of the things they could also do, they could talk of ask people to think about those things. You know, what is it about feminism that is awful? What is it about birth control that is awful? What is it about, you know, what is it about um, not necessarily um equality but egalitarianism where we're being right. fair to people what is it about that that's awful and another thing i think too is this expectation so the anger creates a barrier and we have to remind people we have to re-theorize anger because that's one of our biggest challenges is our anger being used against us so instead of people being angry with us about inequality and oppression they're mad at us for being angry about it yeah. But the other thing is that there's this expectation that we all do the same things in the same way. So I, I, I've been using this little in or this little saying lately. Um, you wouldn't go to a dentist to get a pap smear and you wouldn't go to a gynecologist to get a cavity filled. But they're both doctors in the medical field. Right. There is a way in which feminism gets sort of boil down that we all do the same thing. We're all very different. We're very different people, women, men, um, people who do not identify as male or female, where some of us are cisgender, some of us are transgender, some of us are heterosexual, some of us, and we all take very different approaches to eradicating and theorizing and then eradicating oppression. But the fact that the knowledges that we have and the politics that we have are not respected means that people don't take the kind of care to understand the complexities of our communities. And we perpetuate it sometimes by being so thirsty to have a platform that we flatten it also. But I think that's one of the things that people can do, too, when it comes to these types of um, simplistic hashtags is to just remind people that we are more complex than they understand because sometimes they just really don't know they're just literally ignorant and I mean by not knowing and I think that really that's really interesting too because it speaks to the idea that there are so many different ways that we can fight the issues that are that are laid out in front of us and it doesn't have to be I you don't have to go to something you're not comfortable with you can say what is my what is my issue? What is my story? Which leads me to the to the last question. Okay. Question I'll ask you really quickly. Okay. Um, the personal is political, and that's a very powerful concept. Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel that well, my story is not important, or I have nothing to say. I'm not political. And how would you say that just by being, just by existing in this place, this time, this yeah. this political stage, you are political? What? How would you speak to that? Well, I go back to this sort of. Um, because I get this question too from from students often, I go back to the idea that politics are way put simply. Of course, it's of course it's much more complicated than this, but politics are you know a way of doing, um, and we do things all the time, and those things have implications that are that 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 um travel for uh, much further than than us. Empathy is not something that we are taught, right? We live within a, a, a so-called meritocracy, a rugged individualism. It's all about me. We built it. I did this. I did that. I, I, I. And so it's hard for us to go back and try to get people to have empathy for someone else. So the personal is political for me is not just about me being important, but me recognizing that other people, I share a space with people. And what I do has implications for not just me, but for other people. For more on Heidi Lewis and her work, check out femgeniuses.com.